Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is the next session of the Global AI Community on Virtual Tour. I am Eva Pardi, one of the hosts, uh, and I also have my co-host on my side is uh, Alicia. Are you online? Good morning. Good morning, Alicia. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be back. Good. I'm happy that you're back. So, um, we are going to host our next session with uh, Hugo. And uh, Hugo is a data scientist and educator at DataCamp. And he has worked in applied math research in uh, cell biology. And uh, he also has a PhD in uh, pure mathematics. And uh, his main interest now is uh, promoting data and AI literacy and fluency and helping uh, to spread data skills uh, throughout organizations. It sounds pretty awesome. So, Hugo, could you tell me quickly where are you uh, broadcasting from? I'm broadcasting from Sydney, Australia. I am I'm in literal quarantine. I feel... Until recently, I've been using the term quarantine quite liberally. I feel everyone else is now. So um, I, I live in New York, flew back to Australia recently in a hotel room with a door guarded by policemen and, uh, and military. At 7 p.m. here, they may knock on the door to ask questions about repatriation or to deliver toilet paper. I'm not sure. So if that happens, um, but it's, it's, it's fine in here. I'm on day 10 and I get out of quarantine in four days. I get out on Easter Sunday, actually. So I feel good that I, I get out on the literal resurrection day as well. So yeah, that's that sounds cool actually. So you are also going to resurrect yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So um, and your topic today is going to be about how to build a scalable AI strategy with IPTOP. Yeah. And uh, I I like to. Uh, I like to I like this uh, fun fact that uh, when the first time we heard this IPTOP for a lot of people it was like uh, what what is that is it like some uh, new um, strategy for I don't yeah, know geo. yeah so um, um, could you tell me about that just quickly yeah absolutely so IPTOP it's IPTOP and it stands for infrastructure yeah. uh, people tooling organization and and processes and I think um for a lot of business leaders, scaling an AI, AI strategy or a data strategy is an overwhelming task. I mean, what does that, that even mean? Um, so the way we've thought about it at, at DataCamp um, and a lot of our colleagues, collaborators in other organizations, uh, such as Netflix and Airbnb, which I'll get to in, in, in the talk, um, you know, we think about breaking it down into these five components. And of course, the two foundational components are infrastructure and people, and then tooling, organization, operations and processes on, on top of that to scale those as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the quick intro. I will let you uh, kick it off in a moment. Just one more uh, technical information, guys, that uh, you are welcome to ask questions or comment on the session. Uh, you just have to go to chat.globalai.community, which is also visible, by the way, on the screen uh, during the session. So I think I give you the stage, uh, Hugo, so cool. take it away. Um, so I, my screen is shared. You can see it. Just to confirm. Yes, we can see it. Okay, fantastic. Um, so thank you all for joining today, and, and thank you, Eva and, and, and Willem and everyone else working to make to put this event together and for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure. As we've just discussed, I'll be talking about building a scalable AI strategy uh, with IPTOP, which stands, as I said, for infrastructure, people, tooling, organization, and and processes. Um, Eva introduced me wonderfully. I'll say a few things. This is a photo of me when I'm out of quarantine. Um, and currently, I don't even have a beard trimmer. So essentially, certain things are, are difficult. But as Eva said, I'm a, I'm a data scientist at DataCamp. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about uh, DataCamp in a second. Um, I also do a lot of data and AI evangelism and AI strategy consultancy work. Um, my PhD was in pure maths, then I worked in applied uh, math research in cell biology, and then I built out the foundational Python curriculum at, at DataCamp. So I used to host a podcast called Data Framed, um, which essentially is about the industry of data science and AI as a whole. Um, so check that out if you're, if, if you're interested. Um, I just want to flag, the work I'm about to present is joint with many, many people at, at DataCamp, um, but I wanted to flag that uh, my wonderful colleague, uh, Ramnath uh, Vijanathan, um, who leads product research at, at DataCamp was essential to the work that I'll be presenting today. Ab absolutely key. Okay. 
Um, so just a bit about Data Camp. Uh, what we want to do, our mission is to democratize data science education by building the best platform to learn and teach uh, data skills and make data literacy and data fluency accessible to millions of people and businesses uh, around the world. Um, our motto is learn by doing. Uh, so we essentially have relatively short videos from expert instructors, whether they be industry professionals or uh, open source um, software package developers and maintainers. But those videos are five minutes long. Then we spin up computational engines and get you coding straight away in, in, in the browser with real-time feedback. As I said, I built out the Python curriculum. We also have R, SQL, Git, Shell, spreadsheets. Um, and we're doing a lot of non-coding courses for executives these days, which I personally find very exciting. Okay. Um, so just to give you a rundown of what we'll be talking about today, or what I'll be talking about, um, about how to scale your AI strategy uh, and then go into the details of infrastructure, people, tools, organization, and processes, okay? So before talking about actually scaling an AI strategy, I just wanted to have some working de definitions. Um, this is uh, a blog post of Dave Robinson, who is principal data scientist at Heap. He used to be chief data scientist at DataCamp, and before that, he was the first data scientist at Stack Overflow. Um, he broke it down really nicely. And this is, these are rules of thumb that may not hold all the time, but essentially he broke it down into data science is something that produces insights into the world and into businesses. Machine learning produces predictions and AI um, kind of pipeline systems that actually produce actions. Uh, and so you can think um, data science, for example, can produce a customer segmentation, okay? Um, which is the insight into custom behavior. Uh, machine learning uh, can uh, predict whether a customer will churn or not, for, for example. Um, an, an example of an AI producing an action is when Twitter surfaces something to me. So the entire pipeline that results in Twitter actually surfacing something. Now, of course, machine learning bleeds into all of these, right? So um, unsupervised learning in the form of uh, clustering produces a segmentation which doesn't really produce a prediction. It produces insight in the form of data science. Um, reinforcement learning, on, on the other hand, uh, can produce actions in, in, in the end. Um, and supervised learning is really the realm of predictions. Um, but these are kind of the, the rules of thumb that I, that I like to think along the lines of. Um, I also really want to make clear that before you have AI, um, at the moment, you need a lot of data, right? With the advent of reinforcement learning, maybe you, you won't need so much um, data collected in the real world per se. But the way I think about it is that um, the most impactful and effective AI strategies will stand on the shoulders of robust data capabilities. I'm quoting myself in real time there. Um, but for that reason, I, I think it's actually um, important to not decouple an AI strategy from a data strategy. So today, uh, I'll be using AI strategy and data strategy essentially uh, in, in, interchangeably, but talking about talking about both, okay? So what can data science do? Um, I think there are a few useful ways to think of it. Uh, one very useful way is slicing it into three components, into descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. Um, so once again, this is the breakdown we've kind of already seen that descriptive analytics essentially is BI, business intelligence, getting the right data into the hands of the right people, okay? Um, so this can be in the form of dashboards, reports, visualizations, emails, faxes. I don't know if anyone still uses faxes, actually. My doctor does. Um, then there's predictive analytics, which is the realm of machine learning, and then prescriptive analytics, uh, which is decision science and the decision function. Um, and with something we've discovered a lot at Data Camp through our customers and our own work is that um, a lot of business leaders tend to feel that uh, the data work and AI work that happens at their organizations um, may not be efficiently incorporated into decision science. Um, and this is why McKinsey, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, really since a couple of years ago, has been pushing this uh, new role, a data translator, which is uh, an, an interface or a, a membrane between the decision function and the data function to help translation across that layer, okay? Um, in terms of descriptive analytics, what are we really talking about? As I said, we're talking about dashboards where you can have monthly active users or page or bar plots, um, uh, page visit length by age. Um, there are many other ways you can describe the world through data to people. Um, in the bottom right, you see, perhaps all you need to know is a number, uh, the number of visits your website ha had. And then you can say um, the day over day change, for example, if, if you want to report that as well. In terms of descriptive analytics, I, I, I wanted to mention that um, 
you know, there are lots of interesting ways that data is being reported currently with respect to coronavirus. I actually really have enjoyed watching uh, Ryan Strook's um, tweets from CNN, uh, whereby he's been putting out tweets which display data, not in a visualization, uh, but in a list, which I think is very telling. And you may not get the same sense you will from a visualization, but you get the idea of growth and you can do day by day comparisons very well. And even seeing from the 1st of March, the number of digits, numbers that actually grow, the order of magnitude and change there is, is very interesting. In terms of purpose of descriptive analytics uh, as well, um, Gail uh, Varico, who uh, is a um, core contributor and co-maintainer of Scikit-Learn, the Python um, machine learning uh, package, been building dashboards with epidemiologists. Um, and as he says here, to, it's to raise awareness on the evolution of COVID, um, a dashboard, uh, with statistical analysis, analysis displayed simply and an explanatory text, understandable by the general public. So when we're talking about having some sort of AI or data strategy, having an actual purpose is incredibly important here and stating what that purpose is, okay? Now, before we really dive into the meat of this talk, I just wanna talk about another way to slice data science. Um, there's data work to inform decision-making um, there's automated actions from data pipelines. So the first one is your classic uh, decision science. Um, your second one is your classic AI. And then the third is a hybrid. It's humans in the loop, okay? Whereby we have machines doing hopefully what they do really well. And then humans um, being incorporated that either as maintainers or are actively making decisions at points in, in the pipeline. And that's why I like this, this cartoon. It's a robot that um, <clears throat> got fired from work because they got replaced with a human. Um, I, I don't look forward to the day when humans, when robots unionize, um, but I, I do want to flag thinking about humans in the loop. It's interesting that, um, deep blue beat Kasparov, uh, a chess back in the day. And yet currently today, um, uh, the best chess players are what are known as centaurs, which are human, uh, machine, human computer pairs. Okay. Um, so I want to ask a question and Eva's going to help, help, help with this. But as I said, a lot of business leaders we speak to feel that, not all or actually a small proportion of the data work that they actually gets done in their organizations is actually used to inform decisions. So I'd love to know what percentage of your data work is actually used in your organization, do you think? And you can quantify it in terms of human hours or resources in terms of how much money it costs to pay for this data work. Um, is it zero to 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75% or 76 to 100%? So the question is quantifying data work by whatever makes sense in terms of human hours or uh, resources or, or um, <clears throat> the amount of investment, the amount of money, what percentage of your data work is actually used? Is it zero to 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75% or 76 to 100%? Um, and we'll just take a few moments. I think Eva's gonna, gonna report back once we get, get the results in. Yeah, so the poll is online and it is available via the chat uh, we have available for you. Um, and yeah, just uh, let's wait a bit. Sure. And so I'll, I'll say a few more things. I, I, I think this is actually part of the reason um, for roles such as Data Translator um, is to kind of bring the decision function and the, and the data function back together. Um, and what we're talking about here is actually a cultural challenge, okay? So if you, one of the points is a data scientist can have some of the, the best machine learning algorithms or the best dashboards they produce, but making sure that they're consumed by the right decision makers and then acted on is incredibly important. I almost feel like, I mean, we don't, we barely see this in science, but I almost feel like decision makers should uh, pre-register um, their decision making processes. So they'll say, if I see this data, I'll do that. If I see this data, I'll do that. Because I think a lot of the time what happens is that decision makers will see data. If it confirms what they wanted to do anyway, they'll do it. If it doesn't, they'll find a reason to do it uh, anyway. Now, of course, this doesn't happen all the time, but I think some of the, like most of the huge wins um, in, in data work are in tech, um, in, in the AI sense, in the automated sense. But when it comes to the decision function, we're still yet to see it implemented really correctly in a lot of other industries. Um, yeah. Uh, just a second and I can actually yeah. give yeah. you a number. Great. 
because we got a lot of answers actually. Amazing. That's what I like. <laughs> Engagement is high. And uh, and I just uh, waited a bit now because we actually had a lot of lot of incoming uh, votes uh, just now. So. <laughs> cool. All right. So let's see what is the setup right now. Um, most of the answers uh, has come to the first one, so 0 to 25 percent, 50 percent wow. of the voters. That's amazing. See, that's very telling. Last time I asked this, it was 50 percent said one or two, but if 50 percent say one, that's that's incredibly telling that as as a society of data people and decision makers, we have a huge amount of work to do for figuring out how to pair up these two functions, right? Um, super interesting. And I'd love, you know, if people are making comments or talking about it. I'd love to hear about that um, at the end in the questions or, you know, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn as well. I'm Hugo Bound, H-U-G. How do I spell my name? Quarantine has a weird effect on me. H-U-G-O-B-O-W-N-E. But feel free to reach out because I'm really interested in, in talking about this, this type of stuff, everybody. Okay. Cool. So thank you very much, Eva. I, I appreciate your, your help with that poll. So if we're talking about scalability of, of, of AI and data strategy, what the, what the heck are we talking about? Okay. Um, so people use the term scale. I mean, I work for, well, we're not really a startup anymore. Well, well what's the definition of a startup? But you hear the word scalability thrown around wi willy nilly in, um, in, in startup culture. And so the way I think about scalability is it refers to the ability to take on an increased demand without incurring proportional costs. Okay. Um, there are adjacent definitions to this. Uh, including the harnessing of network effects, but I think this is a is a nice kind of baseline definition of, of scalability. So then, what is a scalable AI strategy? That's one that I think can scale with all the other stuff coming in. So it can easily accommodate new projects, easily accommodate new employees, techniques, phases of growth, tools, infrastructural layers, among uh, other things. Now I know this is not this is a slightly vague strategy because it has a lot of uh, definition because it has a lot of moving parts, but I think that's important for us to be flexible with, with respect to this, okay? So in terms of scaling your strategy, there are kind of two ways to uh, approach thinking about an AI strategy in general. Um, and this is something that Dave Robinson, my former colleague, uh, came up with. And on the x-axis, we have how many people can do it, okay? So as you get more and more people doing doing uh, kind of <clears throat> the I suppose the, the simpler things um, and, and essentially making things that are possible, not the simpler things, the possible things, making them widespread. So getting everyone in an organization to be able to build scatter plots or do uh, uh, time series forecasting, that type of stuff. On the y-axis, we have how hard it is to do. And this is making the impossible possible, uh, such as like large scale distributed computing, uh, de um, deep learning neural, neural nets, CNNs, that, that type of stuff, self-driving cars, okay? So when we're talking about scaling an AI and data strategy, we're really not talking about uh, change in making the impossible possible. It's actually making things widespread. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about talking about scaling. So as I've said a couple of times already, and it's nice to have talked about this with Eva, Eva before, um, <clears throat> so that we're all on board now, um, to scale your AI strategy, the way we think about it is scaling five things. You start with the uh, two foundational layers to scale. That's infrastructure and people. Um, and then on top of that, you want to scale your tools, your organization and processes. So we're going to go through these uh, one by one. Okay. So first, let's talk about scaling infrastructure. Um, so why do we even need infrastructure? Okay. Um, what What is the role of AI or, or data science? I really think the role of data science in particular, and then AI that's built on top of it in any organization is really the ability to transform raw data into insights, decisions, and predictions, and then build that into AI pipelines, okay? So you start with this, this raw data uh, originally, right? Um, so the question is, how do, we, how do we get, this is one arrow, but we need to break this down into component parts. So how do we think about scaling this process? So we start off with raw data, which may be in, uh, uh, app specific databases. Okay. Um, and then we'll put that into a data lake. We'll put that through a data pipeline. We'll build views through that and then use tools to develop insights, um, 
either in the form of dashboards, knowledge repositories, visualizations, uh, and then machine learning pipelines, okay? So these are all kind of the moving parts of how we do that at, at, at Data Camp. But I'm happy to answer more questions uh, about this at, at any point. Um, <clears throat> I just want to mention this because I think all organizations kind of build this stuff internally and we have kind of these siloed approaches within organizations, but there really are commonalities. And essentially, although the tools and maybe some of the technologies may change, there are commonalities in terms of going from raw data to data lake to pipeline to views to tools uh, and then to insights. So at Netflix, the same thing, same thing happens where we have um, the raw data um and then we get all the processes coming out to to all the views here and then we get all the insights on on, on top of that okay similarly at airbnb now this uh blog post it's a great blog post i think it's slightly um out outdated but it gives an idea of precisely how the same thing works uh at, at airbnb okay um and one of the points here one of the most important things i think um is to allow everyone in the organization access to the data. And essentially, the way we think about that is in terms of enabling data discovery. Okay. Um, so here we actually have a dashboard, uh, which is which is searchable and, and tagged in a variety of ways. So people can figure out where they need to go to even answer the question um, that they're asking at any point. Okay. Um, similarly, at Lyft, they have uh, their data discovery engine called Amundsen, which I think is such a, uh, such a great name. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Explorer, uh, Amundsen. Um, and, and so the point there is, is to say that they, they have a very similar, similar resource. Uh, so this is something that we see happening across the industry. So to recap this section, um, scaling infrastructure is key to scaling, uh, data and AI work, um, and essentially developing a principled, uh, and by principle, I mean, via this particular framing of the pipeline, a principled and modular tech stack is essential. Um, this can be used for data discovery, can be used for online experimentation, can be used for machine learning and more, okay? So then how do we think about scaling, scaling people within the organization? Um, so depending on your size, you wanna identify the key roles that you need for your data work. Um, and this is very uh, dependent on size. So a small startup uh, probably won't want a machine learning scientist or even a data scientist early on. Um, they'll likely need a data engineer to lay the foundations. There's, of course, the, <clears throat> I suppose the, the old trope now, well, relative, it's, I mean, it's a few years old or let's say half a decade old or maybe even a decade, like a, a, a young startup wanting to hire a data scientist. So they hire their first data scientist who ends up being a data engineer for the first, first 18 months. Um, so essentially having a principled approach to identifying the roles that you need to hire and when you need to hire them early on, okay? Now, once you identify these roles, mapping out the skills necessary by, uh, by role, okay? Um, so we can see what's um, a, a good example here. Um, okay, so you see someone working on infrastructure, for, for example, um, requires mostly data infrastructural skills, but they require a bit of data science as well, to essentially to know how their quote unquote product is, is used, right? Uh, someone working on online experimentation needs to know a bunch of uh, data science um, and they need to know a bunch of kind of um, uh, data tools uh, as well, right? Um, so I think those two, oh, let's look at uh, ETL as well. Uh, you need um, a bunch of uh, data science, but you really need a bunch of e even more data engineering as well. So mapping out the skills that you want every employee, um, <clears throat> every role to have. Um, is, is how we think about it. Um, and then to measure competencies. There are several ways to do this. Um, one way is we have a product at Data Camp called uh, Data Camp Signal. And this is an assessment whereby um, if you're a business that uses Data Camp, you can uh, get your employees to take it and assess them on a variety of things. So you can assess them on modeling, tidying data, data visualization, these types of things. Um, and it allows you essentially to assess your employees um, and, and the roles and then to identify gaps. And of course, the point of identifying gaps, of course, is in the name of continuous learning, which we all realize in the data world is so important now. Um, and, and then personalizing learning paths through continuous learning. And one way we do that at Data Camp is through, through custom tracks. Um, but a lot of places have a lot of different ways of doing this. Uh, Airbnb has their data university vision. Um, and as it says here, this is to empower every employee to make data informed decisions 
by providing education that scales by uh, both role and team. Okay. So the way we think about um, data fluency uh, at Data Camp, a company being data fluent essentially is in which um, everybody who works at the company knows the skills, has the skills they need to know to do their job, the data skills to do their job as, as best as possible. So we know what that looks like for data engineers, data scientists, data analysts, business analysts. But then when thinking about other departments, um, so for example, what does a VP of marketing uh, need to know about, um, you know, um, machine learning pipelines or um, customer flows in order to uh, produce the best nurture campaigns possible? What does a chief people officer need to know about bias in machine learning if they're going to incorporate productized machine learning tools into their hiring flows, okay? So these two roles, VP of marketing, chief people officer, may not need to be able to write SQL code, but they definitively now and in the future will need to know bits and pieces about AI, machine learning, data science, analytics in order to do their job as best as possible. And that's why we're thinking about our courses, our data courses for executives and AI courses for executives. Um, but as I said, a company is 100% data fluent when everybody in the organization has the skills that they need to do their job as well as possible. So to recap this section, you want to identify your roles uh, that you need, the data roles. You want to map out the skills by role. Um, then you want to measure competencies and determine the gaps. And then you want to personalize the learning paths and support continuous learning. So how do we think about scaling tools at Data Camp? So Let's step back a bit and think about the data science workflow. This is um, a figure, a famous figure in, in, in the data world now, produced by Hadley Wickham, um, who creates a lot of the packages in, in the tidyverse and works for RStudio, uh, most famously ggplot2 and, and dplyr, although many others. Um, so when you're doing data analysis and data science, you import your data, then you're tidying it, and then you have this... Um, iterative process of transforming, visualizing, and modeling it, and then transforming and visualizing and modeling it, and then transforming and, and, and so on, okay? Um, now, in the R and Python ecosystem, there are a lot of tools for doing all of this, all of these things, um, but in any given organization, people who write code, data professionals will essentially be writing kind of the same boiler, same-ish boilerplate code time and time again to import stuff from their particular databases, tidying it in the form they want, transforming it in a way that answers questions within this org, okay? So in any organization, you want to build tools on top of these open source tools. So at DataCamp, we've done that. Um, we've got packages in R and Python, DataCamp R and DataCamp Py. Um, we've got DC metrics, which is all to do with um, transformation. Uh, we have visualization tools uh, and, and modeling tools. And of course, I, I, I got lost in the iterative loop as commonly happens with data scientists and forgot to mention the key point that you want to communicate all this stuff at, at the end and impact decision making and inform decision making. And you want the data function to be an input into the decision function. Um, I just lost myself in the communication now as, as well. Um, so I suppose what I'd like to do now is talk to you, tell you kind of a few common questions we ask at Data Camp and tell you about the type of tools we, we've we developed in, in internally. Uh, so first, yeah, I mean, we, we write packages, right? Uh, which are fully documented, have autocomplete um, so that they work just as well internally as do our open source ex external packages. Um, and I suppose the next step to think about not only building these tools, but then building building frameworks. Okay, so I'm going to tell you two common uh, questions we, we we think about at DataCamp, which I think are quite quite representative um, of the types of things we do. Uh, and this happens in a lot of organisations. So someone will come and say, uh, Hugo or Ramnath or Gabriel or Emily, I, I want to track course completion rates over the last year, aggregated by week, uh, broken down by technology topic and track, um, or Someone from uh, the enterprise team will come and say, I want to track uh, recurring revenue over the last two years, aggregated by quarter, broken down by segment and geography, okay? Um, now, to abstract both these questions away, I mean, you can answer both of these in an ad hoc fashion, then answer all your questions in an ad hoc, ad hoc fashion, essentially, but there's um, it's, it's definitively inefficient. So what both these questions want to do is they want to track a number, they want to track it over a certain time period, 
They want to aggregate it by, by some time period um, and they want to break it down by some dimensions, okay? So we've built um, a, a framework called um, Tidy Metrics. Um, essentially, um, just let me... Um, I'm sorry, yeah, we use Tidy Metrics um, in, in, in order to achieve these, the, these types of things. And this answers one of the questions um, so essentially, we're getting um, courses by technology, topic, and track. This includes the completion rates. Uh, we're crossing by these, and then we're looking at the periods and, and, and summarizing it, okay? Uh, so essentially, uh, this is one example of the types of frameworks that we, that we build. I just want to say there are lots of frameworks um, across different organizations for um, other uh, types of processes. So this is Airbnb's framework for online experimentation, where you see you have uh, the metric on on the left, um, all, all the way through, you've got the control uh, mean, you've got the treatment, uh, percent change, all, all of these things. Um, so this is an example in online, online experimentation. Um, there are also examples in, in machine learning. And there's a there's a great paper from Google uh, by Scully uh, et al. Um, in which the authors state that only a small part of machine learning systems is the learning code itself. Um, the rest is a vast complex infrastructure that includes various aspects of data collection and, and processing, okay? And we can see all of these, you might want to call them kind of satellite processes, uh, but essentially they're, they're not satellite. They are so key uh, to the machine learning and the, the learning code itself is only just a small uh, part of it there, okay? Um, so thinking about the other parts that, that go into it, this is from a post by uh, uh, Robert Chang, uh, who Robert um, is a machine learning data scientist at Airbnb. Um, before that, he was a data scientist at Twitter on, on, on the growth team. He has, follow him on Medium. He has wonderful posts on, 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 on Medium. Um, where, and in this one, he goes through all the parts of feature engineering, model training, model selection and validation, and productionization. Um, and the learning code, of course, is really only a small part um, in, in the middle here, right? Um, even, and this is super cool, um, there's a feature engineering product at Airbnb uh, called, called Zipline. So this is a framework that's productionized um, where people can create features that are useful for them, for their machine learning pipelines, and put them uh, in, in this product, and it means other people can access them uh, as well. So features aren't created just on an ad hoc um, basis ne necessarily, um, but they're reused and, and, and reproducible across the organization. Um, so to recap, what we've just gone through is that tools uh, are key to abstract over common data tasks. Um, tools may be cool, but frameworks are cooler. Uh, and these are key for all types of AI and data work, including descriptive analytics and predictive analytics. And the point here is uh, one-time overhead, plus maybe some maintenance, but um, for, for serious gains in efficiency, such as, you know, being able to use features that other people have created uh, in AI products at Airbnb. So now we've gone through infrastructure, people and tools. Let's talk about organization. And essentially, I'm talking about um, organizational structure here, okay? And how is your data team and your data work uh, structured? Um, there are two common models for data stream stru structures. One is centralized, whereby you have a center of excellence of, of data scientists, uh, and it's it's an individual team, okay? Um, and they field requests from, from other teams and give back results. Um, almost a service desk of, of sorts. Um, although, yeah, um, let's, let's avoid that term, potentially. Um, on the other side, you have a decentralized whereby you have uh, a data scientist on each team or analyst on each team uh, reporting to the head of finance, the head of product marketing or engineering, okay? Um, now, which one of these would be better for your organization? Okay, and thinking about this is key to thinking about scaling your AI work and your data work. So I wanna go through both of these and think about pros and cons, okay? So the decentralized. There are pros. Each team has a dedicated data scientist uh, there's alignment between the data scientist um, and the team's needs uh, due to a common roadmap. Um, data science has a seat at the table within the team and a voice that's constantly within the team. And there are fewer dependencies across teams. 
Now, there are serious cons though. So it's harder to move resources between teams to handle load, um, okay? So for example, let's say you're going for your series B, right? And um, you need most data science hands on deck for a bit uh, in order to um, just get the finances out to talk uh, totally um, uh, um, in line in order to uh, show to potential investors, okay? At this point, um, if you have uh, your data scientists decentralized, it's a lot harder to move these resources in order to do, do that immediately. Um, another con is that a manager of a team may not have know enough about data science in order to ask, ask the right questions. And there may be a mismatch culturally uh, between the conversations that can be had. Um, and the data scientists, when they need help um, with technical stuff, they won't be able to ask their manager about that. Another con is it's harder for data scientists to collaborate. Um, and what I did use the term service, uh, support service or service desk. In, in this case, it's harder for data science to drive longer term projects. Um, okay. So the centralized model, of course, um, has pros and cons. The pros are it allows data science to function as a center of excellence, um, promotes more collaboration and, and better knowledge sharing. Um, all data scientists have a manager who knows about data science, can move load, uh, move resources to meet loads, um, and it's easier to advocate for consistent technology stack and, and better tooling. Now, notice that, of course, the pros and cons are pretty much flipped from the decentralized model. Um, the cons are it complicates coordination between data scientists and their stakeholders. Data science may not uh, be aligned with the other teams, and it's also an extra function for the company to support. So the way a lot of organizations have uh, approached this is actually combining these two models into what's now known as the hybrid model, where you do have an individual data science team, but you have dotted lines to other teams. So essentially, um, you will have uh, a data scientist on the finance team, and he's part of the finance team, he or she is part of the finance team, um, and they're also part of the data, data science team. And so um, in this sense, um, the pros are data science can func function as a center of excellence. They can drive a common tech stack, et cetera. They can collaborate and align on goals. And there is better alignment between data science and business units. Um, problems are everyone has at least two teams and that's something cultural to deal with. Um, and the risk of uh, mitch, mismatch, mish, <laughs> mismatch of expectation um, uh, between data science and the uh, business unit, okay? So just to recap, when we're thinking about um, scaling organization, essentially we're talking about the the way the uh, company uh, and, and org structure um, is aligned. Uh, and it, as I said, it depends on the company. But if you want to if you want to scale your strategy, um, you need to think about the best organizational structure to scale that. And the hybrid approach has been um, the best across a lot of organizations. But there are pros and cons to each, including the centralized and decentralized. So to wrap up, I want to talk about scaling uh, processes. And we could talk about this for days. Um, but essentially, processes uh, are ways of working, right? Um, and, and, and I'm thinking more about having a principled approach to how we do uh, the data and AI work, OK? So one thing that's really important, I think, is to define a, a project life cycle, OK? Um, so we see here. Uh, this is from this, this is the Microsoft team uh, data science process. Um, one of the cool things about this is we see the stages, business understanding, uh, data acquisition, data understanding, deployment, modeling. We see an iterative process there. Um, but also here, we have tasks required in each stage. So we see in the data acquisition and data understanding stage, we have data source, data pipeline, environment, wrangling, explore, exploration, and cleaning. Um, and one of the really cool things about this type of life cycle and making it explicit in an organization is that people can jump in and out. If you need um, extra hands, you can bring someone in and say, hey, I'm actually in the data acquisition stage figuring out uh, the data sourcing. Or you can say, um, we're actually in the deployment stage um, and we're monitoring. We're looking at our concept drift. We're looking at our data drift. You can say, I'm in the modeling stage and I'm debugging. Like I've got this vanishing gradient that's just kicking me in the ass constantly. Um, never heard anyone say that, but that's something that could could be said. Um, I mean, I did just just say it. 
Okay, so defining project life cycle is, is incredibly important, um, as is uh, standardizing uh, project structure, okay? Um, and so these are two examples that I, I really like. There's project template. So this tells you in a project what to put where. Um, there's also cookie cutter uh, data science, um, which is a really cool uh, project structure by uh, uh, my friends at Driven Data. Um, and uh, I, I don't necessarily suggest you to choose either of these per se. I mean, I like, like both of them. Um, uh, but the takeaway is that having a standardized project structure um, will allow people to jump into a project once again and you to do other projects which uh, model yours and take away the cognitive load of figuring this out ad hoc e each time. Um, maybe it's worth noting that your project structure may need to be industry specific. Uh, there may be requirements such as in pharma or finance uh, in terms of how and where you store things. Um, and I, I mean legal requirements, uh, legislative requirements there. Probably all onto this. But embracing notebooks in terms of processes is incredibly important. This is perhaps not, okay, I've got to be careful here. Um, Joel Gruz has a talk, 10 things I hate about Jupyter Notebooks or something like that, right? In which he talks about how productionizing fr from notebooks can be, a re can be really challenging. Of course, Netflix famously um, productionizes Jupyter Notebooks and has maybe like 100,000 um, Jupyter Notebook batch jobs running a day or something, something along those lines. But the point is here, um, for a lot of data science and AI work, you want to be doing in notebooks. You want to you want to develop these narr narratives and do um, these iterative processes. Um, I've recently been playing around with SageMaker Studio, um, and their notebook functionality is really interesting. I think it still has quite a way to go, but um, the ability to spin up elastic notebooks um, and, and spin them down instead of just trying to like spin up an EC2 instance and then putting it like transferring a notebook to it, running it, shutting down the notebook, shutting down the instance. Um, elastic notebooks, I think, will be um, really cool for the future of data work. This here is a screenshot from Jupyter Lab, which is like, I hesitate even to say next gen notebooks because it's so much more than notebooks. You've got a notebook in the middle here. You've got a visualization here. You've got, um, you can scroll through your data here. You can pop up a terminal if you want. Um, you've got your local file system here. It's really cool. So if you haven't checked out Jupyter Lab, I definitely suggest just looking at that. There's also, if you want to do notebooks with R, there's R Markdown um, for, for R Studio where you can create notebooks. And when I was preparing this talk, I discovered this cool um, R Markdown notebook of visualizing the ocean floor, which um, is an example of a contour plot. Um, for Hawaii, which I thought was pretty cool. Okay. Um, also embrace version control. Now, of course, a lot of data scientists are, uh, are onto this, but I think as we as we share data work with a lot of people in organizations, it's important to recognize and, and let everyone know that version control is something that's, that's really essential. Um, the final thing, and I'm going to list a few more things that you can think about in terms of processes, um, but style guides are really important. So this is by Hadley Wickham. This is from the Tidyverse Style Guide where he writes, good coding style is like correct punctuation. You can manage without it, but see, I can barely read that. What it says, you, but it sure makes things easier to read, okay? So you want to write good code to collaborate with other people well so other people can read your code. It involves good commenting as well. But even more importantly, you want to write, have a good coding style so that you in a week or you on Monday after writing code on Friday can read the code that you've, that you've written, okay? So these are the types of processes that I think are important to um, think about. There are, um, oh yeah, this is one other example of, a, of, the, um, of the style guide uh, in R, and this is in a data camp exercise. I included this actually um, because, yeah, this is the style guide and you see a plot um, developed here, but you see that because population, um, this is life expectancy versus population um, for, 180 nations or something like that. It's the gap-minded data set. Um, you see that because populations occur over orders of magnitude here. Um, you have all of these squashed uh, down here, all of these data points. So this is why we want to plot on log axes, okay? Um, and it's incredibly important when we're thinking uh, about um, plots of um, coronavirus currently. This is why we want to plot on, on, on log axes. 
So here we go. We have the same figure plotted on a log axis, and we see a lot more of the data is is visible. Um, now, Eva and I might discuss about discuss this in in the question and answer session. Um, but I, ju I just remember this. I'll be doing a Facebook live coding session on uh, the uh, the John Hopkins University uh, COVID nineteen data set in in a couple of days. I'll promote it on Twitter. You can check it out there. I don't know if um, Global AI will send around an email with it uh, as well. Um, but I mentioned that because something I'm making painstakingly clear in this live coding session is that, let me get this right. Yes, that, thank you. Us, oh yeah, I was just gonna say, is that plotting um, on log axes is important so we see all the data. Um, but it's also very important to recognize that we, as humans, when we're plotting the number of um, people contracting coronavirus or people dying, this doesn't, we don't feel that in a log sense. Each each death is incremental um, and is as important as uh, as the other. Um, and so what we feel as a society isn't logarithmic. So when we see a slight increase on a logarithmic scale at the top end, that could be as large and often is as a small, uh, uh, as a large increase down the bottom. So although it's important for visualization to plot on log, we also need to recognize that we feel and experience the world in a deeply linear, linear sense, okay, uh, when interpreting these plots. Um, so that was about style guide, and I started riffing on log axes um, and, and plugging my own Facebook Live coding session, um, which I'm actually very excited to, to bring to you if, if you're interested. Um, other processes to, co to consider, I just listed five, but there are a lot more, uh, code review, uh, pair programming, um, robust data testing, um, throwing data parties, having like a, a gluten-free pizza party or keto or whatever you're into these days, you know, on a, on a Thursday afternoon at work um, where you'll like explore the databases and see what you can find um, and develop a culture around that is a cool process. And then developing a process and a culture of incorporating uh, data work into the decision function, as I, I think I just have said so many times because it's so important in this talk. So to recap, Define project life cycle, standardize project structure, embrace notebooks and version control, and all the many more things, um, such as throwing data parties that I just mentioned. So to wrap up, what I've told you um, is to scale your AI and data strategy by scaling the foundational layers of infrastructure and people, uh, and then on top of that, scaling your tools, your organization, and your processes to form uh, this conceptual framework of IPTOP. So to scale, AI and data strategy by scaling IPTOP. Thank you. You can follow me on Twitter, um, connect on LinkedIn. Um, we've got time for questions now with, with, with Eva and um, feel free to reach out uh, with any questions as well. And thank you all for joining. Thank you, Hugo. It was uh, really cool and it was nice to uh, get an insight on uh, these uh, um, processes. And we actually have some questions. Um, so, but before I'm saying the question, there is also a very nice uh, comment for you. It says that uh, Hugo is my favorite educator in Data Camp. That's, that's pretty yeah. nice. <laughs> and I, I love that a, a, a student and, and it, that some learners joined as well. That's really cool. Do, does that, is there a name associated with that comment? Yeah, and I can tell you later, okay? Okay, cool. Well, thank you, whoever you are. That's great. <laughs> All right, so questions. Um, how valuable is it to have a DevOps team member on a data science team? Hmm. Great question. Um, I, it's organizational dependent. And at an early stage startup, I think the data engineer and the data scientist need to be, I mean, you want the data engineer first. And then when you hire the data scientist, you want them to be like, like this, right? Um, and you want your first data scientist to really understand a lot of the engineering stuff as well. As you grow, I don't think it's necessary that they're on the same team. Um, but what I do think is that there needs to be a very strong cultural connection between them. Um, they need to they need to be able to, you know, approach each other and talk and nut things out together and they need to speak a lot. Um, just as the way, you know, I'm just thinking of analogy in other departments, just as the way, you know, your marketing, your product marketer, may not need to be like in all the sales, um, in all the commercial team meetings, but you you want them to be really active in, in, in those discussions. And, um, 
you know, your VP of marketing doesn't necessarily need to be in all the meetings with um, with your customer success team, but it's incredibly important that they're aware of all the all, all the pain points and all the challenges there. So short answer, early on, they should be tight as. Um, then as it grows, they there needs to be a cultural environment that allows them to communicate and they need to understand each other's pain points, I feel. Thank you. So what is a good mix for a data science team, for a company just starting with data science? Um, I don't know what that means. I mean, what's a company starting with data? It depends on industry. It depends on size. I mean, if you're talking about like an insurance firm that's 10,000 people and they're trying to, um, you know, get in on, 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 on the data function, um, it's very different from, from early on. I, um, so I don't have, it's so dependent. Could you just ask the question one more time and I'll try to think of an example. So what is a good mix for a data science team for a company just starting with data science? Um, the, okay, the way I'm going to state this, I'm going to talk about tech, okay? Um, essentially, tech moves in three phases. Um, I mean, very generally, right? You want to lay... Uh, data foundation. So you want a data engineer before you even hire any any data scientists. Um, then the first data science work you want is basic analytics, right? You want someone who can bring out insights from the data to make decision functions. You can see what your customers are doing, what the product's doing. You want them to build dashboards. You want them to be talking with people all the time. You want them to be developing insights. Um, then as as you're trying to achieve growth, I mean, quote unquote, exponential growth, right, in, in a startup. But as you're trying to achieve growth, you, you want to you wanna do a lot of on, online experimentation um, to see um, exactly what works and, and, and what doesn't. So you want, um, you know, pretty serious statistician, breed of data scientist and data analyst at that point. Um, and once you've really got a uh, product market fit um, and, and achieve the growth, I think, you want to start to personalize products using machine learning and then build out uh, machine learning teams. And of course, you might ask at big companies, you know, are all big companies like in this machine learning phase? And the answer is yes and no. The answer is yes, in the sense that they do do a lot of that. Um, but the answer is no, in the sense that big, big tech companies are building out a lot of new products where they're trying to achieve growth as well. So at Airbnb, for example, yes, you have personalization and, and machine learning. But when they bring out new products, um, they have, you know, a lot of online experimentation and, and growth teams working with that as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for the answers. I actually wanted to have some chat about other stuff too, but we are running out of time and we have to uh, have some time for the next speaker as well. And uh, if you guys have any questions left that we didn't answer yet, you can just uh, go to the uh, chat uh, page that is uh, stated on the on the on this um, session as well, you know, on the screen. And um, you are welcome to ask your questions and Hugo will answer these when he gets there. And all the resources will be available online. Also, the video is uh, recorded and it will be available on YouTube uh, at some point soon. <laughs> um, I think that is it for now. I want to say a huge thank you uh, for this session because it was uh, really interesting and uh, we got a lot of uh, information again. So thank you a lot. And uh, I hope you also enjoyed this just like me. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, everyone, for organizing. And thanks, everyone, for joining as well. Thanks, Hugo. I also thank you for all the attendees. See you later. Ciao. Yeah.